My name is Vincent Hache. Uh, I'm Director of Systems Architecture at, uh, at Rambus, uh, working on their CXL data center products. And I'm uh, Jérôme Glisse. I'm a software engineer at Google. Great. So as, as I said, today we're going to talk about uh, multi-headed devices, give a high-level introduction of what they are, uh, what capabilities they, they provide. Uh, there are two different flavors of multi-headed device, and we'll talk about the differences. One is a multi-headed MLD or multi-logical device, uh, and the other is a multi-headed SLD, single logical device. Once we've established those two flavors, we'll talk about what, what management looks like for, for an MHD. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a capability set that's been added in 3.0 that, that is very important to devices, pooling devices like uh, multi-headed devices, which is the dynamic capacity device capability framework. And next is going to be uh, how, do we, how can you use this kind of uh, memory uh, from a software point of view, you know, uh, these multi-headed devices. And also what, is, uh, uh, what do you need on your host operating system to be able to uh, make use of them. And finally, uh, how to manage this memory at uh, an infrastructure level. So CMAC gave a quick introduction of, of pooling in, in, in 2.0, and I'll just do a bit of recap. Pooling is, is a concept that was first introduced in, in, in 2.0. It's, no, it's not new to 3.0, uh, but there was only one type of device that was, that was able to do this sub-device pooling uh, level, uh, and that's the multi-logical device, or MLD. Um, an LD is, is uh, the, the term given to a host context. It's, it's a, it's a um, specific configuration and, and, and uh, coherency domain for a host. And so the MLD's job is, is segregating traffic in separate LDs, making sure hosts are isolated. They can, they can all map the memory in their own unique way. Uh, there was a limit of, of 16 hosts, so an MLD was capable of providing an, an LD context for up to 16 hosts. But it was only able to do this with the help of an MLD-capable switch. Uh, the switch was responsible for uh, taking traffic from each of the hosts and, and applying a unique identifier that, that the MLD could associate with one of those LDs, called a, a, a logical device ID, or LD ID. So the switch would tag traffic from a host to the MLD with this LD ID, and then strip it off in responses from the MLD, because the host, the host didn't want to deal with LD ID. In 3.0, we've added a new pooling option, uh, and it's the multi-headed device. It's a Type 3 device with multiple CXL heads. And head is, is um, the term we use for the link, the host link. Um, as I mentioned, there, there are two types. There's the uh, multi-headed uh, SLD, which is just single logical device per head, uh, and a multi-headed uh, multi-logical device, or MHMLD. Now, an, an MHSLD is, is the most obvious implementation of a, of a multi-headed device. Uh, an SLD is presented to each head in the device. So if we were mapping heads to LDs within the device, it's just a one-to-one -one mapping. It's pretty straightforward. And that allows the host to just d directly connect to, to the, the uh, multi-headed device. So if you see the architectural breakdown on the right, uh, at the top, we've got the heads of the device. And there, there are as many of those as the device can support. And then we've got this head to LD mapping layer. And that goes one-to-one -one into this pool of LD contexts that the device maintains for each of the hosts that it's, that it's servicing. Uh, and in an MH uh, SLD, that's, that's just a simple one-to-one -one mapping. Beneath that, the LDs map into the pooled memory. And we'll, we'll return to that concept in a minute. And MHMLD, probably pretty obvious where we're going with this. It, it, it is capable of prevent, presenting MLDs on at least one head. Uh, there are no requirements that the LDs presented on heads are the, you know, the same number. There, there are no mapping requirements. If a device is capable of presenting an MLD on any head, it's considered an MHMLD. Uh, and the implications of that are that that 
head to LD mapping gets a little bit more complicated. It's a one to N relationship. Uh, it doesn't have to be consistent. Uh, so you'll see in the, the, the example, we have an SLD port on, on head zero, head one has three LDs and, 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 and so on. It behaves exactly like, the, a head with multiple LDs mapped to it behaves exactly like a 2.0 MLD behaves. It's got a limit of up to 16, um, and it requires a switch for the uh, MLD functionality. So I, if we take a look again at that, L, what, what's labeled here is the LD resource allocation, the mapping of the LD pool into the pooled memory, that looks very familiar from in 2.0, the management of LDs within an MLD. Fundamentally, an MHD is, is a device with multiple LDs, right? So we don't call it an MLD, uh, but is managing multiple LDs. We've already defined all those management concepts. Uh, so we're able to just reuse the MLD management framework that was defined in, in, in CXL 2.0 and only had to add a, a small set of commands for discovering the head to LD mapping. Everything else is the same. One of the concepts that was missing uh, uh, for an MHD as well is um, the target of the LD management transactions. There wasn't a good, a crisp definition of that for MLDs in 2.0. So in an MHD, we've defined a concept, the LD pool CCI. Now the LD pool CCI, uh, CCI stands for Component Command Interface, uh, and it is the target of all uh, fabric management commands uh, in, in CXL. Uh, the LD pool CCI is the target of, of commands managing those, those LDs. So all, all of the same capabilities, allocation of pooled memory to LDs, uh, QoS settings, uh, discovery, uh, all that configuration and management work uh, is done through the LD pool CCI. So now that we've established that baseline, um, this is a second capability set defined in 3.0, but it's, but it's very relevant to this discussion, discussion of a pooling control, dynamic capacity device. So the problem we were trying to solve was uh, b before something like the dynamic capacity device framework, um, changing memory allocation in a pooling device, like, a, like an MLD, changing the allocation of that pooled memory among the LDs was very disruptive to the host. Um, it, it required the HDM decoders in the device uh, to be reprogrammed. Uh, it's very impactful to the host. It needs to relay out its memory. Um, traffic needs to be quiesced. Uh, likely a system reset is, is, is required. There are ways you could potentially avoid a system reset, but practically speaking, in, in 2.0 host, a system reset's required. Um, so it was a very straightforward presentation of the allocated memory uh, to the host. Uh, if we take a look at uh, an example of, a, of, on the right, a pooling device assigning some of its capacity to host A and some of its capacity to host B, the host just maps exactly the capacity that's been assigned to it. So host A is just mapping its usable, it's programmed its HDM decoders to just map its usable capacity, host B, its usable capacity. If we change this assignment at all, we, we need to reprogram everything. So uh, what dynamic capacity device offers is the ability to change this allocated capacity without requiring an HDM reprogramming. And the way we do that is the HDM decoders are programmed to cover the maximum amount of capacity that the pooling device would ever expose to that host. And then there is a software-based uh, uh, capability built on top of that that tells the host what regions of that full range it's actually allowed to use. So that's handled by software in the kernel. The, the, the device has some uh, CCI commands that will advertise to the host, here, here are the, the regions you, you may access, and, and here are the regions that, that we'll treat like an HDM decoder miss. The way it advertises it is through a, um, a, a block-based list of 
capacity called an extent list. So a block, a memory block, is the unit of allocation under the DCD framework. Um, and uh, if in this example here, we've got a, a two terabyte capacity device on the top that supports a, a 256 megabyte uh, gra block granularity. So that, that represent, that's 8,000 possible blocks in, in that range. Um, but we don't want to constantly be passing an 8,000 uh, long array to the host. So uh, the extent list is a condensed version of that, where uh, 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 consecutive blocks are aggregated into something called an extent. An extent uh, is a, a start address of device and physical address, uh, a length, and then some metadata called a tag. And so that condenses down the list into a, a very concise reporting of, of the range. Um, a dynamic capacity device can support up to eight different regions with different properties. Uh, the sorts of properties that can be defined in a region are its coherency model, uh, whether it supports the 3.0 back and validate, something we called hardware coherent versus software coherent, uh, whether it's shareable, uh, and the granularity of the block size. So it'll be the fabric manager in the device that goes in and configures all these regions and configures all of the allocations uh, within the device, and then the host receives uh, interrupts, letting it know that allocations have changed. And um, no, the software side is, um, how do you um, uh, use this kind of memory? Well, the good news is that uh, you use it the same way as you want to use a CXL 2.0 or a CXL 1.1. Uh, memory uh, devices, it'd be exactly the same from the uh, host operating system point of view and from the uh, uh, from the software, sorry, from the software uh, point of view. Uh, obviously, we will have a different characteristic in terms of bandwidth and latency. Um, you know, we like to say that uh, with multi-headed device, we should be able to get close to one number hop away um, from one CPU to the CPU connected to the device head. Um, and then there's various approach how you can actually make use of that kind of memory. You can use it as extra memory capacity. So you have a pooling device that allow you to outplug memory to a server in rack, for instance. And that does allow you to avoid um, uh, to have this dynamic capacity uh, for each host inside your rack. Uh, you can use it as a tier memory. You can use it as a, as a lower cost memory uh, where you can actually migrate memory that is not hot inside your workload. Um, and you can also use it as a personal storage. Um, and there is a new Z model uh, we, can, uh, we can have now, uh, is that we can share memory actually across multiple hosts. So you can have a region of memories that is visible to multiple hosts at the same time. Uh, you can either have like, um, as I was saying, you can either have like a soft hardware currency or you can have software currency. Um, it's up to you to choose. Um, on the host side, from the, from the operating system point of view, I'm going to uh, focus on Linux here. Um, you know, it's all there already. Uh, Linux is being uh, capable of supporting memory out, plug and out, remove, which is really what you want for dynamic capacity. Uh, but obviously, uh, Linux kernel has been, uh, you know, this uh, this kind of support has been added for when it was actually um, a physical out, plug of memory, not logical out, plug of memory. And so for for that reason, there was like no improvement done to the out, plug uh, and out, remove uh, cut pass of the Linux kernel. So there is still improvement that we can do to the operating system to improve the performance and the uh, uh, capability of the kernel to do it uh, more quickly and faster to uh, plug and out remove memory. Um, you will also need to have a, a new dynamic capacity driver inside Linux kernel to be able to talk to the device and talk to the fabric manager. Uh, it's not only kernel space, actually it's gonna be kernel and user space. Um, the policy, you know, when to uh, request for uh, hot plug, when to request for memory, when to actually uh, give back memory, is something I think we want to give uh, to let uh, user space handle, and it's something we want to let the uh, infrastructure manager to handle. Uh, you know, it's not something we want to freeze in, uh, in time. Uh, so, from the host point of view, you know, um, there is not much work to be done. A um, lot of improvement and a lot of, of things to tie up, but uh, uh, we we can get there very quickly. The big question is going to be how to manage memory at an infrastructure level. Uh, you know, be memory become a resource that you can reallocate dynamically between hosts. Um, and the infrastructure software, so how you manage your fleet inside your data center, uh, can allocate resources to each uh, server individually. Um, and, you know, hot remove, hot plug of memory, um, 
it's not something that is, uh, I've I don't think people ever thought about it uh, when we were designing the scheduler of your data center. So that's where you're going to have uh, to spend more time to think about it and to optimize your scheduler and to think about how you want to schedule these kind of new resources. Uh, but I think there is one um, key element here to understand is that the main use case we're seeing um, inside the data center is that by allowing you to upload capacity to server, you can improve the TC of your data center because you can avoid stranding memory on server because usually what we do in data center is that we over provision the capacity of each server for the worst case scenario. In these cases, you know, with a memory, uh, memory pool, you can avoid uh, uh, over provisioning each server, but instead you have this pool that allow you to uh, adapt the capacity of each server depending on the workload it's running. Um, and what we really would like to see is that, that the industry work together um, on open source low level software. So anything that, you know, Linux kernel, anything that is about um, the management fabric and so on to be open source and uh, share among the industry. And because we believe really like the value will be uh, how you actually uh, schedule um, and manage this memory at the fleet level. And um, I'm sure that everybody will want to have its own solution at that level, but not at the low level so far. Um, and with that, uh, we would like you, uh, you know, uh, to consider joining the CXL consortium. Um, and if you're interested in software development, there is like a, a Linux kernel CXL mailing list. Um, and you can actually, I think you, you could see like a first multi data hardware um, on Astro Lab Boost. Um, and there is like a dynamic capacity hardware uh, coming, uh, coming in next year probably. Um, and please join us on Visually. Thank you. Thank you.